out after starting the stream this time. Sounds more manageable. Oh boy, do I have a lot of work to do today. Having a good evening this evening. Just gotta double check all my ins and outs. Hello, cats. Get rid of these guys. Why, why, why? Dropped. Ooh, we're just hanging out. Looks like my boat drifted away over here. We'll be starting a story in about 17 minutes. Looking forward to whatever comes our way then. And we're getting close to the end of the book, so I have to find new material pretty soon. That's exciting also, as well, too. Okay. Need more food. And I think it would be best for us to head west. Fair enough. I did say west. That way. Thump. 
Looks like we have ourselves some crabs ahead. Exciting, and a poisoned froggy. Don't touch it. Who else is here? Say hello if there was anyone. Say hello, hello. I'll say hello back. Hey, the little, little crabs. Oh, I got bit. Should be chopped. Is that even more? Ooh, that's exciting. I did not leave my humble abode well prepared for an adventure. But that's okay. We will make a do with what we have got. Got ourselves some wonderful lag. Checking too many chats. That's mud. We'll be starting in about 12 minutes. Looking for a nice place to camp out and tell stories in the bog. Look like nettles. Don't wanna. Don't wanna head over there. Pete is on fire. Ourselves a termite wants to have some fun with us. We're not gonna let it do it. See that little uh, little shadow? <laughs> it spooked me a little bit. I'm like, hey, buddy, let's be friends. Hopefully, we don't see too many more of those. It's not 
the, that's not the way that I want my uh, heart rate to quicken. Oh, hey, buddy. head home. We're going to head home now. We're heading home. We're heading home. We're heading home. We do not need to be caught out in the swamps during a red or red sky, whatever this is. Blood, the blood sky. We're getting out of here and we're going to never... Hey, 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 hey. How's it going, buddy? Hey, hey. Hi, guys. Hey, how's it going? Hey, how we doing? Gosh, you have a lot of health. I hope there's no one behind me. Okay, all right, no one's behind me. Gosh, they're fast. Come on, let's have a ch Oh, oh, there are more of them. All right, we're leaving. We're leaving. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. We don't need this. We don't have enough time for this. Well, we got eight minutes. Oh, hey, hey, how's it going? Hey, how you doing? How you doing? Hey, how you guys doing? I'm in the mud. I'm leaving the mud. Hey, okay. Hey, there's more of them. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> We're leaving. <laughs> We're getting out of here. Hi, guys. <laughs> we got. Hey, how's it going? Hey, buddy. Hey, okay. I don't know how many are behind me. I'm not even going to look. I'm not even looking. Oh, I'm in the mud. That's great. And I'm going to die. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I'm going to die. Okay. All right. Let's get out of here. Lord, how many? Oh, my God. <laughs> there they are. Hey, buddy. Can they not? There's a frog there stopping. Okay. We're having fun. We, we've, got, we've got eight minutes and three hearts. And more baddies. I don't think I'm. I don't think I'm gonna survive this. Yeah, I don't think I'm gonna survive this. Oh, and a piranha, and I'm dead. <laughs> well done. All right. Okay. Well, that you know that about wraps it up. I'm gonna have to wait until this uh, whatever is over, and then get back to my grave. Wherever that is. Way out there. Okay. Hopefully it won't just spawn. Hmm. Cool. Let's see. Okay. Well, you know... Still wearing my armor. Still got my sword. Let's see if this this uh oh too far away. There were like ten of them, weren't there? Something like that. Some crazy number. And then the piranhas came, and then everything just you know happened. Not not a fan of the blood of the blood season, the blood sky. Not uh not not exactly conducive to uh, healthy appetite of living. Okay, well, I guess we're done being outside. And it will be my job probably next time on stream to go back and get that stuff because way too dangerous to go get it now. That being said, I think they can knock down doors as well during this time, so we might as well set up a little something to stop them from doing that if I see them spawning in. There's one over there. Okay. Hello, Quill. Welcome on in. Glad to have you here. 
I don't know if you I don't know if you saw me just getting completely slaughtered by like 12 swamp hags. I'm exaggerating, but it felt like that. Glad to have you here. Looking forward to story time in about 5 minutes. You did. Oh, oh, and I've got a little friend running towards me. Look at him go. Boy, he's so excited. I should probably not be out here. I think I'm just going to head back on inside and wait for story time. <laughs> oh, dear. All right, we're in our little hidey hole. The, the night is dark and full of terrors. Uh, have you ever seen the the blood uh, the blood sky before quill this is a special event that happens only occasionally it really messes with the graphics though as you can see oh this is too exciting well we got what four minutes maybe we can get some more uh, some more materials down here while we're waiting for the to calm down outside. Good mercy, that stuff's creepy. Mm. Let's pick up some more limestone. Because who knows, maybe I'll uncover something else while mining the limestone. Do I have both of my buckets? I, I don't have both of my buckets. I'm not going to survive down here if I don't have my buckets. I think my buckets died with me. Yeah, it's a it's a pretty wild uh pretty wild encounter. The swamp hags start spawning a lot more and they're given a very large speed buff. Couple that with me running through peat and mud, I don't stand much of a chance. So we're gonna let them do their thing out there. You Minecraft, I paint. I Minecraft, you paint. looking forward to more of your puzzle pieces. I think I, I did see the most recent one. I was quite pleased. Alright, let's make more buckets. Um. Okay, two buckets. Uh, we need some water. down Put that there make sure there aren't any baddies and then grab some water and then sneak back inside no one the wiser hello cinder welcome on in glad you could make it you made it just in time for the uh, for the blood sky and I died rather quickly so I hope you're proud of me. <laughs> Such an embarrassing act. Uh, let's grab some sulfur. Ooh, food. Food I didn't know I had. That's good. Hello, E. You don't have shredded cheese, which you needed for dinner? Oh no. I'm sorry. I would send you shredded cheese, one, if I could, and two, if it would reach you and still be fresh. I'm, I'm sorry I can't do either of those things. <laughs> oh gosh, I can't even go down here anymore. It is now almost the turn of the hour, so I'm going to go ahead and switch over to creative. And we're going to have a grand old time. Actually, you know what? Before I switch over to creative, uh, I need to shut my door in the honorable way. And then I can go creative. Okay, there. Creative. Okay. 
ramen. Ooh, potato and cheddar soup. That sounds nice. Sorry though, again, cheese is amazing. The hour has turned. So we're gonna hang out right, probably right here in this nice and spooky environment. Let's make sure that the background looks acceptable. Okay, good enough. And we're gonna read more uh, fairy tales from the Brothers Grimm. Hope you enjoy your stay here. Let's see. All right, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm actually gonna write down the names of the stories that I read because that makes it easier during whatever it is that do after story time. We are now on chapter 34. The singing, springing, Lark. And after that, we will be reading the story of the Goose Girl. So, if you don't mind the creepy sounds coming up from the blood sky. And we'll go ahead and get started. Chapter 34. The Singing Springing Lark. Once upon a time there was a man who was about to set off on a long journey. Before he left, he asked his three daughters what they'd like him to bring back for them. The oldest daughter wanted pearls, the second asked for diamonds, and the youngest said, Dear father, I'd like a singing, springing lark. The father said, If I can find one, you shall have it. Then he kissed all three and set off. In the course of his journey, he bought pearls and diamonds for the two eldest daughters, but he searched everywhere without success for a singing, springing lark. He was unhappy about that, because the youngest daughter was his favorite. As it happened, his road led him through a forest, in the middle of which stood a magnificent castle. Near the castle was a tree, and right at the top of the tree there was a lark, singing and springing. You're just what I wanted, he said, and he told his servant to climb the tree and catch the little bird. But as the servant approached the tree, a lion leapt out from under it, shook himself, and roared till every leaf on the tree trembled. If anyone tries to steal my singing springing lark, cried the lion, I'll eat them up. My apologies, said the man, I didn't know the bird belonged to you. Let me make it up to you. I'll give you gold if you spare our lives. Gold is no good to me, said the lion. I want whatever first comes to meet you when you arrive home. Promise me that, and you can have your life, and your daughter can have the lark as well. At first the man refused. The first to meet me could be my youngest daughter, he said. She loves me the most, and she always runs out to greet me when I get home. But it might not be her, said his servant, who was frightened. It might be a dog or a cat. The man let himself be persuaded. He took the singing, springing lark and promised to give the lion whatever came to meet him first when he arrived home. <laughs> yes. Yes, e favoritism indeed. And when he got home and entered his house, the first to come and greet him was none other than his youngest, dearest daughter. She came running, kissed and hugged him, and... When she saw that he'd brought a singing, springing lark for her, she was beside herself with joy. Her father couldn't be glad, though, and he began to weep. My dearest child, he said, this little bird cost me dear. To get it, I had to promise to give you to a wild lion, and when he gets you, he'll tear you to pieces and eat you. He told her everything that hap had happened and begged her not to go to the lion come what may. But she consoled him and said, Dearest father, we must keep your promise. I'll go there and pacify the lion, and come back safe and sound. Boy, this doesn't sound like a corporate uh, <laughs> uh, analogy. Next morning, her father showed her the way, and she set off confidently into the forest. Now, in fact, the lion was an enchanted prince. 
During the day he and all his courtiers had the form of lions, but at night they turned back into human beings. When the girl reached the castle it was nightfall, and they welcomed her courteously. The prince was a handsome man, and soon their wedding was celebrated with great splendor and rejoicing. Because of the enchantment he was under, they slept all through the day and stayed happily awake at night. One day her husband said to her, Tomorrow your elder sister is getting married, and there is going to be a feast at your father's house. If you like, my lions will take you there. She said that she'd be glad to see her father again, so she set off, accompanied by the lions. There was great joy when she arrived, because they all thought that she'd been torn to pieces and was long dead. But she told them all about her handsome husband and the life they spent together. She stayed until the wedding celebrations were over, and then she went back to the forest. When the second daughter got married, she was invited again, and she said to the lion, I don't want to go on my own this time. I'd like you to come with me. The lion said that it would be very dangerous. If a ray of light fell on him, even the light of a single candle, he would be changed into a dove, and he would have to fly away with the doves for seven years. Oh, please come, she said. I'll protect you. I'll keep every ray of light from you, I promise. He was persuaded, and off they went, taking their small child with them. Did I read that they had had a kid? Oh well. At her father's house, she had a special room built, with thick walls and no windows at all. When the wedding lights were lit, he was to stay in the room for safety, but the builders had made the door out of unseasoned wood, and after it was hung, it split and developed a tiny crack, which no one noticed. I know. <laughs> Where's the child from? The wedding was celebrated with great joy, and the procession set out from the church to the bride's father's house. Torches flared and lanterns shone, and as they went past the prince's room, a single ray of light, no wider than a hair, shone through and touched him. And when his wife came in looking for him, she didn't see him. All she found was a white dove. Yeah, I think... I think that the part where they said, um, the prince was a handsome man and soon their wedding was celebrated with great splendor and rejoicing, and because of the enchantment he was under, they slept all through the day and stayed happily awake at night, probably that's when the, they, they had conceived. <laughs> anyway, um, the dove said, I must fly about the world for seven years, but every seven steps I'll drop a white feather and a drop of blood to show you where I've gone. If you follow the trail, you'll be able to save me. The dove flew out of the door and she followed him at once. As he'd said, every seven steps a white feather and a drop of blood fell to show her the way. She followed him further and further away, out into the wide world far from home. Thinking of nothing else but following him, she didn't look aside and didn't rest until the seven years were near until the seven years were nearly up. All that time she hoped that she would soon save him, but she was wrong, because one day as she was walking on, no feather fell and no drop of blood either. She looked up, but the dove had vanished. Well, no human can help me now, she said, and so saying, she climbed right up to the sun. Sun, she said, you shine over every mountain and into every crack and cranny. Have you seen my little white dove flying past? No, said the sun, I haven't seen your dove, but I'll give you this casket. Open it when you're in great need. She thanked the sun and went on her way till night came and the moon was shining. She said to the moon, Moon, you shine all night on the fields and the forests. Have you seen my little white dove flying past? No, said the moon. I haven't seen your dove, but I'll give you this egg. Break it open when you're in great need. She thanked the moon and walked on. The night wind rose and blew against her, and she said to it, Night wind! You blow through all the trees in the world. Have you seen my little white dove flying past? No, said the night wind. I haven't seen him myself, but I'll ask the other winds. They might have seen him. 
He asked the east wind and the west wind, and they came blowing and told her that he, they'd seen no dove. But the south wind came and said, Yes, I saw the little white dove. He was flying into the Red Sea. He was flying to the Red Sea. He's becoming a lion again because the seven years are over, and he's fighting a serpent. Be careful, though, because the serpent is an enchanted princess. Yeah, Cinder, I'm, I'm all about dropping blood and feathers and, you know, teeth and... By gosh. <laughs> yeah, baby teeth. <laughs> Y'all are adorable. I love you. The night wind said to her, Look, I'll give you some advice. Go to the Red Sea. On the right bank, you'll see a bed of tall reeds. Count them carefully and cut the eleventh one, and hit the serpent with it. Then the lion will be able to beat it, and they'll both become human again. Nearby you'll see the griffin that lives by the Red Sea. Climb on his back with your beloved, and he will carry you home across the sea. And take this nut! When you're flying over the middle of the sea, drop it down and a tall nut tree will sprout at once for the griffin to rest on. If he doesn't have any rest, he won't be able to carry you home. Don't lose this nut, whatever you do, or you'll all fall into the sea and drown. What? So she went to the Red Sea and found everything just as the night wind had said. She counted the reeds, plucked the eleventh one, and struck the serpent with it. Immediately the lion forced back the serpent and subdued it, and the moment the serpent surrendered, both of them became human again. But before the lion's wife could move, the princess, who had been the serpent, seized the prince's hand and tugged him up onto the back of the griffin, and they flew away. So there the poor wanderer stood, alone and forsaken once more. She had to sit down and cry. Eventually, though, she took heart and said, I'll keep going as far as the wind blows, and as long as the cock crows, until I find him again. And she set off. She traveled a long, long way until she came at last to a castle where the Lion Prince and the Serpent Princess were living together. There she heard that their wedding was to be celebrated very soon. She said, God will help me yet, and opened the little casket that the sun had given her. Inside was a golden dress that shone as brightly as the sun itself. She put it on and went into the castle, and everyone, including the bride, was struck with wonder. In fact, the bride liked it so much that she wanted it for her wedding dress, and she asked if it was for sale. Not for gold or for good, said the girl, but for flesh and blood. And what does that mean, said the princess? The girl asked to spend one night in the room where the bridegroom slept. The bride didn't like the sound of that. But she wanted the dress so much that she agreed. However, she told the prince's servant to give him a sleeping draught. Uh, yes, he ran away with the unexplained serpent princess. Now they're going to get married. And now the person who married the prince in the first place wants to spend a night in the prince's bedchambers. So... I'm following as much as you are. <laughs> that night, after the prince was already asleep, the girl was taken to his room. When they closed the door, she sat on the bed and whispered to him, I followed you for seven years. I went to the sun and the moon and the four winds to ask after you, and I helped you conquer the serpent. Are you going to forget me completely? Yeah, I agree with you, E. But the prince was sleeping so soundly that he thought her whispers were merely the wind sighing in the fir trees. When morning broke, she was led out of his room, and she had to give up the golden dress. Seeing that her trick hadn't helped, she grew very sad and went out to a meadow, where she sat and wept. But then she remembered the egg that the moon had given her. She was certainly in great need now, so she broke it open. Out came a mother hen and twelve little chicks all made of gold. The chicks ran about cheeping and then ran back to their mother and sheltered under her wings. There was no prettier sight in the world. 
The girl stood up and drove them ahead of her around the meadow until the castle window opened and the bride looked out. She liked them so much that, as before, she asked if they were for sale. Not for gold or good, but for flesh and blood, let me sleep one more night in the bridegroom's bedchamber. The bride agreed and planned to trick her as she'd done the previous night. However, this time the prince asked his servant about the murmuring and rustling in the night. The servant confessed that the bride had ordered him to give the prince a sleeping draught because a poor girl wanted to sleep in his room. The prince said, well, tonight you can pour the drink out of the window. That night the girl was let in again, and this time, when she began to whisper her story, the prince recognized his dear wife's voice at once and embraced her. Now I'm free, he said. I feel as if I'd been in a dream. I think the princess bewitched me and made me forget you, but God lifted the spell in time. They both tiptoed out and left the castle secretly, because they were afraid of the bride's father, who was a powerful sorcerer. They found the griffin and climbed on his back, and he set off at once to fly them home. Halfway across the Red Sea, the wife remembered to drop the nut. At once a tall nut tree grew up high, and the griffin rested on its branches before flying on to their home. There they found their child, who had grown tall and handsome, and from then on they lived happily until they died. <laughs> okay. That, uh... Mm, wow. Well, okay, I, I read it... I read it in a way that made it sound like... Like it was a contemporary until they died. Like, and then they did this until they died. Like, I, I, what it's meant to read... And I was being a little silly. The, the last sentence should have read as, as thus. There they found their child, who had grown tall and handsome. And from then on, they lived happily until they died. Like, more of like a, they lived happily ever after <laughs> type of thing. <laughs> but yes, it does say until they died. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, that was the... That, that story, the title of that story was The Singing Springing Lark. So, mm. yeah, there's there not, not much about a singing springing lark in that story. Yeah, yeah, that, that was, yeah, okay. I, I feel like we have a lot to talk about with that one, so maybe we'll come back to it at the end of uh, this next story, which will be uh, probably the last one we read for the night. It's called The Goose Girl, Chapter 35, <laughs> and they have <laughs> they lived happily ever <laughs> until they turned into pesto. Mmm, pesto. <laughs> Spread that dead people pesto all over my pizza. <laughs> wow. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> chapter 35, The Goose Girl. Let's see if this story ends with something about a goose and a girl. Uh, here we go. And now it's raining. There once lived an old queen whose husband had been dead for many years. She had a beautiful daughter, and when the daughter grew up, she was betrothed to a prince who lived a long way away. Soon the time for marriage arrived, and the daughter had to leave for the foreign land where the prince lived. You should tell me more. I like, I like hearing when people have either heard the story or similar uh, versions of the story. It makes me very happy. The old queen packed all manner of costly things, gold and silver, fine goblets and rare jewels of every kind, everything that was suitable for a royal dowry, for she loved her daughter with all her heart. She also gave her a maidservant who was to ride with her and make sure she arrived safely at the bridegroom's palace. Each of them had a horse for the journey. The princess's horse was called Falada, and he could speak. 
When it was time to leave, the old queen went into her bedchamber, took a knife, and cut her finger. She let three drops of blood fall onto a white handkerchief, gave it to her daughter, and said, My dear child, take good care of this. You will need it on your journey. Was, did the name Falada help, help spark that memory? Then they said a sad farewell. The princess put the handkerchief into her bodice, and they set off on the journey to her, to her bridegroom. When they had ridden for an hour, the princess felt a burning thirst and said to her maidservant, Could you get down and bring me some water from the brook in the golden goblet you're carrying? I'm so thirsty I must have something to drink. The maidservant, and then the horse, and then the handkerchief. Okay, awesome. That makes me happy. The maid said, Get it yourself. If you're thirsty, you can just lie over the stream and lap it up. I'm not going to wait on you. The princess was so thirsty that she did just that. The maid wouldn't even let her use the goblet. Dear Lord, thought the princess, and the three drops of blood replied, If your mother knew of this, it would break her heart. But the princess was humble. She said nothing and remounted her horse. They rode on for a few more miles, but the day was warm, the sun was scorching, and soon she grew thirsty again. When they came to another stream, she said to the maidservant, Could you bring me some water in the golden goblet? She had forgotten the maidservant's harsh words from before. But the maid said even more haughtily, I've told you I'm not waiting on you. If you're thirsty, get down and drink it for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> but her horse can talk. <laughs> and so she's too humble, and the horse is going to do all the talking. Is that what you're saying, E? Jeez. Spoilers. Let's see if that does happen. <laughs> I'll throw cupcakes at you. The princess got down again and drank from the stream. She wept a little, and again she thought, Dear Lord. Hello, Faye. Welcome on in. Glad to have you here. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been it's been something. It's been something of a story time tonight. Again, the three drops of blood responded silently. Oh, if your mother knew, her heart would break in two. And as the princess leaned over the stream and sipped the water, the handkerchief fell out of her bodice and floated away. She didn't even notice it in her distress, but the maidservant had seen it, and she gloated. She knew that the princess was weak and powerless now. So when the princess wanted to remount Falada, the ma maid said, What do you think you're doing? That's not your horse. I'm having him now. And in fact, you can take off all your fancy clothes and give them to me. You can wear these dingy rags of mine. Dingy rags of mine. Dingy. <laughs> that was embarrassing. Go on, hurry up. The princess had to do as she said, and then the maidservant made her swear under the open heavens not to say one word about it to the royal court. If she hadn't taken that oath, the maidservant would have been killed on the spot. Sorry, let me, let me read that again. If she hadn't taken that oath, the maidservant would have killed her on the spot. <laughs> but the hook... Nice. I like being interrupted by the by the lightning using the same interruption that that uh, that you indicated in chat. E. Very good. <laughs> but Falada saw all of this and took good note of it. So with the chambermaid riding Falada and the true princess riding the nag, they went on their way till they came to the royal palace. There was great rejoicing when they arrived, and the king's son ran ahead to meet them. Naturally, he thought the chambermaid was his bride and he lifted her down from her horse and led her upstairs, while the real princess was left standing below. The old king looked out of the window and noticed her waiting in the courtyard, and thought how beautiful she was, how fine and delicate her features. So he went at once to the royal apartments and asked the bride about the girl she had with her, the one who was standing below in the courtyard. <laughs> Yeah, good, good, good luck. Hang in there, E. We're, we'll we'll get through it together. And if it hurts, well, we'll just we'll just bear the burden together. <laughs> I picked her up on the way to keep me company," said the false bride. "Give her some work to do. She'll only laze around otherwise." 
But the old king had no work to give her. I suppose she could help the goose boy, he said. So the true bride had to tend the geese, along with the little goose boy, whose name was Conrad. A little while later, the false bride said to the king's son, Husband, dearest, I'd like you to do something for me. Of course, he said, I'll do it gladly. Then send for the knacker, and have him cut off the head of the horse I rode here, she said. The, the brute gave me a lot of trouble on the way. In fact, of course, she was afraid that Falada might tell the truth about how she had behaved with the princess. The longer he stayed alive, the greater risk that the truth would come out. Yeah, yeah, we're in, we're in for another wild ride, I think. So it was arranged, and the faithful Falada had to die. The real princess heard about it, and she secretly promised the knacker a gold coin if he would do her a small favor. In the city wall, there was a large, dark gateway through which she had to drive the geese every morning. She asked the knacker if he'd hang Falada's head in there, where she could see it when she passed through. The knacker agreed and nailed the head of the horse up on the wall by the gate. Early next morning, when she and Conrad drove the flock of geese out through the gateway, she said as she passed, Oh, poor Falada hanging there, and the head answered, Oh, princess with the golden hair, if your dear mother knew, her heart would break in two. The princess said no more, and she and Conrad drove the geese out into the fields. When they came to the right spot, she sat down and loosened her hair, which was the purest gold. Conrad loved to watch her do this, and he reached up and tried to pull out a strand or two. So she said, Wind, strong wind, take Conrad's hat and blow it here and there. Let him chase it all around until I've done my hair. <laughs> And such a strong wind started blowing that it snatched Conrad's hat and blew it across, right across the meadow, and then led him a chase up and down, this way and that, until he managed to catch up with it. By that time the princess had combed and braided her hair and tied it up in a bun, and there were no loose strands for Conrad to tug, so he sulked and didn't say another word that day. When evening came they drove the, their flock home again. Yeah, it is a little little bit cursed. Gets better, I'm sure. Next morning, as they went through the gateway in the city wall, the girl said, Oh, poor Falada hanging there. And the head answered, Oh, princess with the golden hair, if your dear mother knew, her heart would break in two. When they reached the meadow, once again the princess sat down to braid her hair, and once again Conrad tried to pluck a strand of it, and once again she said, Wind, strong wind, take Conrad's hat, and blow it here and there. Let him chase it all around until I've done my hair. The wind blew up suddenly and snatched little Conrad's hat again, and gave him such a chase up and down the meadow that by the time he'd caught the hat, the princess had done up her hair, and again there were no strands to pluck at and so they tended their geese until the evening. When they returned to the palace, Conrad went to the old king and said, I don't want to tend the geese with that girl any more. Why not, said the old king. Oh, she annoys me all day long. Well, what does she do? In the morning, when we go through the gate in the city wall, she talks to the head of the old nag that's nailed up there. She says, Oh, poor Falada hanging there. And the head says, O oh, princess with the golden hair, if your dear mother knew, her heart would break in two. Then Conrad went on to tell the king what happened in the goose meadow, and how she made the wind blow his hat about. Well, you just go out with her tomorrow as normal, said the old king, and I'll be watching. So in the morning the old king wrapped himself in a cloak and sat inside the gateway and heard the princess talking to Falada's head. Then he followed them discreetly out to the meadow and hid himself among the bushes to watch what happened. Just as Conrad had told him, the goose girl summoned the wind, and it blew Conrad's hat all over the meadow, and she unpinned her beautiful long golden hair and braided it up again. The king saw it all, and when he went, and then he went back to the palace. When the goose girl came back in the evening, he called her to him and asked why she did those things. I'm not allowed to tell you, she said. It's a secret. 
I can't tell anyone. I had to swear it under the open heavens that I wouldn't say a word about it. If I hadn't sworn, I'd have been killed. The old king tried to persuade her, but she wouldn't be moved. Nothing would make her break her vow. But finally he said, I tell you what, don't tell your troubles to me. Tell them to the iron stove in the corner. That way you'll be keeping your vow and you can still unburden yourself. So she crept into the old iron stove, and there she began to cry, and soon she had poured out her whole heart. Here I sit, all alone and forsaken by the whole world, and all the time I'm the daughter of a king. A false maidservant forced me to change clothes with her, and she took my place as the bride. And now I have to work in the meadow looking after the geese. If my mother knew about this, it would break her heart in two. The old king was standing outside by the chimney, and he heard everything that she said. He came back inside and told her to come out of the stove. He had her dressed up in royal clothes, and it was a wonder to see how beautiful she was. Then the old king summoned his son and explained that his bride had married him by deceit, and that she was no princess but only a maidservant. His true bride was right there, the one who had been a goose girl. When the king's son saw how lovely the true bride was, and learned how virtuously she had behaved, he was full of joy. They ordered a great feast to which all the court and every good friend they had were invited. At the head of the table sat the bridegroom, and on one side sat the false bride, and on the other the true one. The maidservant was completely taken in, because she didn't recognize the princess in her beautiful dress. After they had eaten and drunk, and were all in good spirits, the old king put a riddle to the false bride. What punishment would someone deserve if they treated their mistress in this way? And he told the whole story, asking again when he'd finished, What sentence does such a person deserve? The false bride said, She deserves nothing better than to be stripped naked and put in a barrel studded on the inside with sharp nails. Then two white horses should be harnessed to it and drag her up and down the streets until she's dead. That is you, said the old king. You have pronounced your own sentence. Everything you described shall be done to you. And when the sentence had been carried out, the king's son married his true bride, and they reigned over their kingdom in peace and happiness. <laughs> oh dear. That is a wild ride. Wow, those were two amazing stories. I had a lot of fun reading them. I think that uh, I think that that's all I'm going to be doing tonight. Uh, the the singing springing lark has still got me a little bit of a confused state of mind. Yeah, yeah. I would say I would say there's a bit of stress relief with putting a naked person in a barrel filled with nails, dragging them around till they died. That's great. That's good. That's good stuff. <laughs> well, Faye, Quill, E, Cinder. Uh, who else was here? Let's find out. Was there anyone else? Lorlin. And. Gelsaways? Commander Root? And another Twitch TV viewer, which I'm guessing might be a bot. Not sure. Thank you all for being here. I had a really good time. And I'm going to go ahead and end it here for now. Um, and I'll let you know when the next story time is. I, I still have to set up a new... I still have to set up an actual schedule. Uh, but uh, little bits at a time. Love you too, Cinder. See you all later. Bye!